I thought it would be funny to do a kind of like clickbait title where I'm just like the most important material to science. And then you, you could click on it and you could guess what material I'm gonna talk about. And if you were right, you could feel really good and smart. And I would know that people agree with me that this is in fact the most important material to science. Um, for clickbait purposes, I'm gonna hold up a piece of acrylic for the thumbnail and be like, I hate myself. But it's not acrylic, it's not plastic. The most important material to science, the material that has advanced every single field of science more than any other, the material that is important to nearly every single experiment anyone has ever done ever is of course glass. It's glass, glass is the most important thing. But these rules To understand the importance of glass, I will walk you through some experiments and in by no way an exhaustive list of experiments because it's literally every single experiment. Um, I will walk you through experiments that used glass and talk about the properties of glass and why it's so important. We can start in the fourth century. Glassware was first used for chemistry by an alchemist named Mary and she invented, well, I mean, like who knows when glassware was first used by chemists, like it's fine. Glassware, <laughs> according to the history, was first used by an alchemist named Mary and she invented a bunch of different things, but one of those things was an alembic. An alembic is a glass vessel attached by a glass tube to another glass vessel. <laughs> and you can heat the glass vessel and collect the vapors in the second vessel um, as like a dissolution process for liquids. This type of thing is still used today. Um, you may have heard of Mary. Her name lives on in the Bon Mary? Bon Mer? How, how do you say that? Where, where you like double boil chocolate because she, she was known for the boiling things. A Bon Marie. I think that's how I want to say it. Bon Marie. Bon Marie. It'd be fine in English to say Bain Marie. Neat. Of course, glassware is used in chemistry because you can see through it. And I mean, <laughs> glass is optically thin to optical light. You can make glass so that it's optically thick to like UV wavelengths, for example, um, depending on the materials you use. And you can change the color of glass. Boston glass is brown. So if you do not want light to get into whatever liquid you have stored in this glass, like if it's like H2O2, you always see it in those brown plastic bottles because it's, it's dangerous to have light just shining on that. So you can change what light you allow through glass based on how you made the glass or what molecules you put in your glass. You might be surprised to learn that we had glass for over 6,000 years. I know that I was. Glass is made from essentially boiling sand and then rapidly cooling it and you get glass. How did we learn how to do that 6,000 years ago? Because like glassware in my brain is kind of the opposite of like ceramics, right? Like if you take clay and you mold it into a bowl and you put that clay in an oven, you get a like solid, strong, durable, reusable clay bowl, right? Glass, however, is kind of the opposite. Like you take sand, you melt it down, you shape it while it's very, very hot, and then you rapidly cool it and you get a strong, durable glass vessel that you can reuse. How did we come up with that process? I don't think the answer is known, but it probably has something to do with like lightning glass, right? You've seen Sweet Home Alabama. Wow, look at these. It's what happens to Sam when it's struck by lightning. She's pulling you. No, really, I've seen it. You just have to dig it up. When lightning hits sand, it can heat it up very, very quickly to very high temperatures. And then of course it will rapidly cool as soon as the lightning goes away. And so you get like glass, features. So I, I, I guess that's how we learned how to make glass and the techniques developed until the fourth century when someone can just make a glass jar. Crazy. Amazing. Glass is also such a valuable vessel because it performs really well under compression. You're not going to break a wine bottle by squeezing it, right? But it does not perform as well under tension, which makes it easy to shape. 
Right. Um, have you ever been in one of those like fancy restaurants with like the wood ceilings and the industrial Edison bulb light fixtures and you buy like a grilled cheese for like $19 and the cups are wine bottles that have been like chopped. Like you can take any wine bottle, you can do this like in your home, you boil it and then you hit it with like a pick and it will break really nicely, like a really nice smooth break because glass can't handle tension, right? You slammed it with a little pick, the tension caused the glass to shatter in a really nice way. And now you have a cup at a restaurant that's selling grilled cheese, but somehow you spend $70 at. This property can be used to make things like a prism. We can skip all the way to Newton. He has a glass prism and some white light from the sun. The light shines through the prism and he sees that light is made up of a bunch of different colors. He's refracted the light. Then he can do a bunch of experiments. He takes a second prism, pushes it a little further away and the light recombines into white light. So white light is made up of multiple different wavelengths. We have a wavelength theory of light and like wasn't science so much easier 400 years ago. <laughs> Just like playing in your room with some prisms, nice. So these experiments led to like a theory of light. You have Snell's law, you eventually lead to like an electromagnetic theory of light. Um, but the property of glass we can talk about here is the density of glass. You make glass from melting sand and shaping it by rapidly cooling it. You can add things to your initial sand mixture in order to change the properties like color like we talked about. You can add barium to glass and it will be thicker, more dense. It can better be used as a prism because the light is refracted more inside. It has a higher index of refraction neat. Something really fascinating about glass is that the way you make it, like what temperature you heat it to, what mixture of sand you used before, what temperature you cool it at, how rapidly you cool it at, how long you heat it, how long you take to cool it, will change the structure, how dense the glass is, meaning what's its index of refraction, how sturdy and durable is this glass, does this glass shatter easily? Is it really tough? Does it bounce when you drop it? Um, it affects things like the color. It affects how well the vessel can hold materials. Like the way you make glass can determine how light is refracted inside of it or how well it will hold neutrons when you're doing some sort of advanced physics experiment. What about the shape of glass? Um, now it's time to talk about lenses. So Galileo, of course, used lenses to build a telescope. He probably didn't build the telescope, right? He just used it. Um, <laughs> I don't think he, he didn't invent the telescope, did he? He just used one. Um, but the way you shape glass, so this is a, oh, I always get these backwards. This is a convex lens. This is a concave lens, the way you shape it determines what happens to light that passes through it. So if you want to focus light from an object, say a galaxy in space, they wouldn't know about galaxies, say the moons of Jupiter in space, you can set up a series of lenses, gather the light, because the telescope's just a big bucket, right? You gather the light, it collects on some focal point, and you can view the object. You have magnified the object. Galileo used a telescope with glass pieces, glass, it's important, in order to change how we thought about the universe. He confirmed the idea that other people had had that we are not the center of the universe, the sun is not the center of the universe, orbital mechanics are important. Lenses existed before the telescope. People used lenses to correct vision, so Thousands of years ago, people used reading stones, which were just kind of glass spheres that you can hold on to words to magnify them and make it easier to read. And if you're ever writing like a period piece book, I would love for someone to be like, fetch my reading stones, boy, in, in, the, in the text. That, that'd be cool. <laughs> I don't know why. I want to see that in a movie. And he's got like a pocket full of reading stones and he just pulls them out and he starts reading across. Cause like, we're so used to people using their spectacles like this, uh, it'd be interesting. So um, people used 
spectacles to correct nearsightedness and farsightedness. And one of those is a concave and one of those is a convex. And I don't know. I could look it up. But these rose glasses. I think it's really interesting that glasses, like to correct vision, existed before the telescope. And then someone was like, huh, brilliant idea here. We could use these to look at space. Simultaneously, of course, someone was like, huh, brilliant idea here. We could use these to look at Earth, microscopes. Speaking of correcting eyesight, I have a wicked astigmatism and I did not know. It's like absolutely vicious. And I was just like, this is how people see. Like I have 20-20 vision, but I have these big thick boys because I have a terrible astigmatism. And I didn't know, I actually failed a biology lab exam because we were looking at a plant and the exam portion was like, use the microscope and focus on this plant. And I like couldn't do it. I, I wasn't wearing glasses then. I didn't get glasses until I was in graduate school. And I was, I just couldn't focus it. Like the stigmatism made it so like unfocused and focused all looked the same. And I was like, this is the best I can do. Years later, I'm working at a telescope. It's a public night. I'm looking through the eyepiece and I have the little remote that's like doing a minor focus adjustment. Like we found the object and I'm just looking through the eyepiece. And I mean, it's as good as it's ever going to look for me. I think it's fine. And the, the people were looking and they're like, I can't really see what's going on. And so the telescope operator comes over and he's like, Angela, does this look focused to you? And I was like, it's as good as it's gonna get for me. And he was just, he was like, you have an astigmatism. You, you should get glasses. You should go to the eye doctor. And I did and I do. And now I can focus things. I was having drinks, like a, a beer flight, as you do. And as we were talking about how important glasses to science, and I mentioned how like, oh, the telescopes look at space and the microscopes look at earth. Like they're the opposite. Isn't that interesting? And she was like, excuse me, no, no. A telescope is a microscope. They're the same thing. They use the same tools. They're just looking at different things. And of course I did a poll and I found that there's a 60-40 split. I was very surprised by the 60-40 split because it's so, I just, they're opposites. They do opposite things. <laughs> one looks at space, one looks at the ground. The best comment, congratulations, you win, win nothing, compared it to how cold and heat are opposites, but when you measure cold or heat, you're measuring the same thing. And that, that makes sense to me. Fine, a telescope collects light. Um, a microscope collects light. You're just looking at different things. They're not really opposites. But I also think of complementary colors, like red and green are complementary colors on a color wheel. They're opposites, right? But red and green are just wavelengths of light. They're not opposites. So I guess the question actually just doesn't make sense. It's just not a good question. It doesn't make sense to say, are these opposites? Do things have to have an opposite? No. Yeah, but thanks for responding. That was really cool of you. So the microscope. I've looked up the first person to use a microscope. I don't know how to pronounce this Dutch name. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. I have a, I have a question. You, you've heard of Galileo's success with a telescope and you're like, hmm, what's the opposite of that? I'll look at the ground. What, what do you look at? What is the first thing you put on a telescope slide? By the way, did you know PowerPoints are called slide decks because of microscope slides? It's like evolved. I don't know, I'm in industry now and people say the word slide deck to me very often. What's the first thing you look at? Think about it. Like, it's it's hard to put yourself in, in the shoes of someone who has no idea about the microscopic world, right? Because I'm immediately thinking, well, pond water. You know what's in pond water. You've probably looked through a microscope and seen all the gross little things in pond water. but. Before microscopes, no one knew of that. They just thought water was water. They didn't know of the microscopic world. They didn't know about bacteria, so they wouldn't look at pond water because they wouldn't know right away that anything was in it. So what's the first thing you look at? Of course, of course, you're a, you're a man. What do you want to look at? Blood cells, red blood cells. The second thing was sperm.
and he goes on to discover bacteria, telescopes, glass, microscopes, glass, the slides that you put your little things to look in your microscope, glass. Glass is so important. Think of every single discovery that's come from microscopes, like germ theory, cell theory, medicine, biology, all of it. Let's talk about another property of glass. Glass is an insulator. It doesn't have free electrons. It can't conduct electricity. So in the early days of electricity, before electric current and circuits and things were discussed, people knew electricity and associated it with lightning. Another type of electricity was static electricity, and they thought the two were related. There were a group of scientists called electricians, and they would take glass, like a glass rod, because it is an insulator, it cannot conduct electricity, and they would rub like then they would rub a sheep's wool on it to collect static on this glass rod and they would like carry it to a jar and have a big glass of electricity to use later. Glass is really important to early magnetism research as well. The first person to associate light with electricity and magnetism was Faraday. He was a glass blower, a glass maker, but also he researched so many things. Faraday's like a really cool dude. He should have his own video. But he made lenses and he discovered the Faraday effect where he shone light through a magnetic field and also through a lens and found that you could rotate light by changing the magnetic field. Light is related to electricity and magnetism. That's really neat. The science that comes from understanding that light interacts with EM, you know, Maxwell's equations, everything, how computers work, how electricity works, like our understanding of the world and the universe and the speed of light uses these properties of electromagnetism all because we had glass and we could do an experiment. So we've just rapidly gone through hundreds of years of chemistry, biology, astronomy, physics, everything, all the things requiring glass. And I wanna take you to the modern-ish era and talk about photographic plates. So a photographic plate, I actually have one, hang on a second. This is a photographic plate. Can you see the galaxy? Um, I collect vintage science equipment because I'm really cool. That's right. I'm just fascinated with how things used to work. Like I, I love that people used to take data and then like measure this galaxy with a ruler and be like, I've done it. Whereas like now we do that all on computers. Like we're not using our eyes anymore. I love that people used to write code on little note cards and take it to the library and the librarian ran the computer and you would hand her your code and she'd be like, come back tomorrow. And then you would come back tomorrow and you would realize you got like a syntax error and you would have to wait in the line again. I love that. I recently got monetized on YouTube. So thank thanks for liking and subscribing. And if I extrapolate my income from last month, I should be able to afford a vintage analog oscilloscope in like three years, I'm gonna buy it with my YouTube money. <laughs> so this is a photographic plate. You probably can't see it very well. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> in the olden days, this is how photography worked. This is how data collecting worked for science. So you have a glass plate, you put a, like a film of like metals and like a solution and that solution was photosensitive so it's sensitive to light so what would happen is you would collect light onto that film and it would get darker in regions where it collected more photons that's the negative right and then you would take the negative and it would be developed into data right so in the olden days this is data isn't it cool? It's like, this is data. This is how people like did their experiments. They were much bigger. This is just like a little copy. They would take these photos. You would take a photo of whatever your telescope was looking at and it would be developed. And then this would be your data. 
If you've ever seen those pictures of Vera Rubin, who did the galaxy rotation curves with spectroscopy, she has things like photo plates and she's putting them into a device and she's like making measurements. Like in the olden days, you would do a galaxy survey and you would measure like the radius and the brightness based on these photographic plates. And it's not just in astronomy. Um, think of our boy Louis Alvarez. Oh, <laughs> back to glasses for two seconds louis alvarez he solved the equation to make bifocal lenses where it could be a single lens instead of those huge messes that they used to be so like if you ever have to wear bifocals the patron saint of this channel louis alvarez um but louis alvarez like he did all his data science he was doing like gas chamber experiments all of that would be done on photo plates i'll put up a picture and you would measure like the radius of curvature of the particle spiraling out. And that data is how you wrote your papers. The glass was required for all the data. There's a problem now in like archival data. Like that's a job you can get. You can be a data archi archivist, archivist. Um, these things, they get worse over time. So you have like decades and decades and decades of data in these photo plates just like stored in a closet somewhere and you want to digitize them but it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of effort and it's just like how much is gained from having a 70 year old picture of a galaxy i think a lot i think it's really important to get all these digitized the smithsonian has a bunch of photo plates that you can just like look at i think that's really cool but these aren't used anymore it's so neat I'm gonna put this down. Now when you use a telescope, you have like a CCD camera. That's not really true anymore, right? Um, in the past, the photo plates were replaced with charged coupled devices. And I think it's just a really interesting philosophical development in physics where we used to observe photons and we don't do that anymore. Everything we observe is electrons. <sighs> what do I mean by that? um like in the past you're galileo you're looking through a telescope with your eye right you are collecting photons with your eye in the past people used like astronomers had a little notebook and they look through the telescope and they'd be like magnitude seven i just feel like that's a magnitude seven and now we have our ccd cameras and the light hits the camera and that photon is converted into an electron which collects on each little pixel and now that's pulled up on a screen and you're not doing any analysis with your eyes you're not collecting photons with your eyes you're right clicking on the star and it tells you magnitude seven right in the past you're doing like particle physics experiments and you're making your photo plates and you're physically measuring what the photons did when they landed on the plate right or the radioactive particles is fine and you you looked at that with your eyes right and now the particles hit like the the photomultiplier tubes and the signal gets turned into an electron and that's put on a computer and the data reduction is done by a program that was written by someone in 1970 like we used to look at photons, we used to do experiments, and now we just kind of receive electrons. And it changes, it changes science for me a little bit, right? I don't know where I'm going with that. I just think it's interesting. Someone could write like a, a book about it that people would read in the airport, I guess. So glass is the most important thing to science, the most important material. It is the single thing, if we were going to put all of science advancements and achievements onto a material, glass. It's glass, glass is the most important. So isn't it interesting that we do not have a working physics theory on how glass forms or what it is? But these rose glasses. The deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory is probably the theory of the nature of glass and the glass transition. Glass is complicated. It's very complicated. The problem with glass is the glass transition. Glass is not a solid. If you take your water and you put it at 19 degrees Fahrenheit, 
it will very slowly freeze into ice. If you take your water and you put it at minus 176 degrees Fahrenheit, it will very quickly freeze. If you take those two ice cubes, the structure will be the same. The ice doesn't care how you get it to ice. Now it's just ice. Of course, like if you put different things in the ice. But imagine we did that with pure water. Now glass. If you take glass and you heat it to 400 degrees and then you cool it very slowly, the glass product you get will be very different if instead you only heated it to 300 degrees and you cooled it very quickly. Glass remembers how you made it. The resulting structure is different. The physics behind that is open. It is a question. The glass transition question mark. Glass is an unsolved problem, but there's also a lot of myths surrounding glass. Have, have you ever experienced this where you were told a fact as a child and you put that fact in a little truth pocket in your brain and you never think about it again until a decade later when it comes up in conversation and as that fact is coming out of your mouth you're like that that can't be true what probably the most common example of this is when someone's dog dies and their parents are like scooty was taken to a farm upstate because he was sad and now he's really happy at the farm and i know you miss scooty but this is what's best for him you put that in your truth pocket and then you're telling your girlfriend about your first dog, Scooty, and he was so precious and he slept in your bed every single night and then one day he had to go live at the farm. And then you call your dad and you're like, Scooty died, didn't he? He's dead, Scooty is dead. And your dad like laughs at you and is like, I can't believe you believe that. I had this experience while preparing this video because in my truth pocket, in my brain, I was like, glass is interesting. Glass is a liquid glass flows and you know how we know glass flows because in gothic windows the bottom is thicker so over three centuries glass flows and i was like that'll be a really interesting thing to talk about and as soon as i was writing that down i was like that doesn't make any sense <laughs> glass can't flow at the rate of like millimeters per century that would be insane can you imagine if glass flowed like glass flowing would have devastating effects on like windows like if you if you put windows in your home and over 30 years it's gonna flow micrometers you would have to replace the windows and people would be so annoyed that we still use glass windows because they have to be replaced so often you, you couldn't drive an old car because the windshield would be unsafe because the glass at the top was much thinner than the glass at the bottom it makes no sense that people think glass flows <laughs> and i can't believe i learned that fact and just had it sitting in my brain as like i'll tell you something interesting about glass anyway it's not true the way windows are made and were made, they're probably made in a different way now, you would make your glass liquid and you would pour it over like a metal sheet inside a pool of water and it would cool into a very thin, evenly distributed pane of window glass because gravity, like you're sitting on water, everything's gonna jiggle until it's flat. But this process caused the glass to be thicker on one side than the other just the manufacturing process of glass. And so when people were making windows and houses, they were like, we should put the heavy side on the bottom because gravity, and that's why windows are thicker on the bottom. Yeah, that's it, that's the fact, yeah. So I was investigating what the current working theory of the glass transition was, and I found this fun little article from 2008, so it's probably out of date. The title, you nerds. <laughs> But I wanted to talk about this article because it is a really interesting journal piece where they have contacted all these different engineers from like the forefront of materials research and asked their opinion on the state of the glass problem. And I found the article is talking about one person in such a way that even though I'm not in this field, I feel like I know exactly who this person is. It's like this archetype of scientist personalities. Let's explore it. So here's a quote from the article. 
Peter G. Wolnes, a professor of chemistry at the UC California San Diego, thinks he essentially solved the glass problem two decades ago based on ideas of what glass would look like if it cooled infinitely slowly. I think we have a very good constructive theory these days, he said. Many people tell me this is very contentious. I disagree violently with them. <laughs> and I love this. There is a type of scientist who there's a type of scientist who writes these very thick, very mathematically dense, very difficult to read and nonsensical papers. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying there is a type of professor who's like, I've solved this problem. Check out my paper. And when you go check out the paper, it's like 40 pages where instead of using the traditional variables, they're doing it in velocity Fourier space. And instead of using the definitions of angles, they're using the same name for the angle, theta phi, but to mean different things. So if you want to read this paper, you have to invest nine months of work to understand what they're talking about. They did not communicate their ideas very well, but they think they've solved it they publish the paper, move on to something else. <laughs> Here's a quote from David Reichman, a professor at Columbia. It surprises most people that we still don't understand this. We don't understand why glass should be a solid and how it forms. Dr. Reichman, when asked about Dr. Wolne's theory, I think a lot of the elements in it are correct, but it's not a complete picture. Theorists are drawn to this problem because we think it's not solved yet, except maybe for Peter. <laughs> I love the archetype of this scientist, this theorist who's like, I've solved the problem. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you think you solved the problem. And instead of continuing to work it, instead of trying to explain it, instead of writing a better paper that people can read, they're just like, I've solved it. And everyone's like, yeah, but we're still working on it because no, no, you didn't. Who's that Pokemon? There are more theories of the glass transition than there are theorists who propose them. It can just get so controversial and so many loud arguments and I don't wanna get involved in that myself, says Dr. Weitz from Harvard. <laughs> Dr. Wolnes continues, I thought the problem was solved in 1990. I, I solved the problem. Um, so he moved on to other things. <laughs> A scientist from France says that the, Dr. Wolnes and his collaborators insisted that he was right. It's like they were trying to sell you an old car. I think Peter is not the best advocate for his own ideas. He tends to oversell his theory. Since that theory in the 90s, progress has been made. And every time someone writes like, we found this new thing with glass, Dr. Wolnes will go back to his theory and be like, yeah, that matches what I thought. Why didn't you just read my paper? Here's an example. He returned to the glass problem around 2000s, convinced that with techniques he had used in solving the protein folding problems, he could fill in some of the computational gaps in his glass theory. Among the calculations, he found that dynamical heterogeneity was a natural consequence of his theory. So he suggested that the math was too difficult to solve at the time, but when people come up with a new idea, a new result, he goes back to his math and he pulls it out as well. Which again, I don't think it's wrong. I just think it's very funny to claim you've solved it, but then have to keep revisiting it and re-explaining it and people don't believe you. It's just very funny. Here, here's my favorite part. So there are some people who work in glass, Dr. Bouchard and a colleague, Julio Baroli, that's a great name. So they take Wolm's theory from the 90s and they have translated it into something that's more readable. Um, they say, for a long time, I didn't really believe in the whole story, but with time, I became more and more convinced that there is something very deep in the theory. I think these people had fantastic intuition about how the whole problem should be attacked. I think it's very funny because if you've written this great and beautiful theory and no one understands it and no one cites it and it doesn't make sense to most people because it's very complicated, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's not written in a way that it communicates it very well. And then I, have to take this theory and spend nine months understanding what you're talking about and then rewriting in a way that makes sense to our current knowledge of the problem and then communicating it to people. Isn't it now my theory? 
Like, I'm not talking about the credit. We're not in this for credit, right? We're scientists. We want to advance the knowledge. If your theory is indecipherable, is it advancing the knowledge? Does it matter if it's a correct theory or not, if no one can read it? I obviously have met none of these people and I do not understand glass at all because that's not my field and I'm very specifically talking about a person in my field. If you write a 30 page paper that no one cites and no one understands, you cannot critique other people's work and be like, well, I've already done this in 1984. No one read that in 1984. No one could understand it. It was useless, okay? <laughs> this article ends with a really nice quote from a Dr. Harrowell where he says, Theorists have had to guess about elementary atomic properties of glass, and he wondered whether one theory could cover all glasses, since glasses are only defined by a thing they don't possess. Like, you, say, you see a solid that is not ordered, that does not have a crystalline structure, and you say that's a glass, but can you describe every single glass with the, the same theory? Because the glasses do behave differently. Um, he has a great quote where he says, they are grouped together because they lack a common characteristic, they lack order. And there could be many reasons that order is thwarted. If I showed you a room without an elephant in the room, and the question is, why is there not an elephant in this room? It's not a well-posed question. From, from my cursory research of this problem, the glass problem is still a problem and not solved. I feel like we would have seen someone win a Nobel Prize for solving the glass problem. I did find a fantastic like seminar, colloquium, from a researcher, Dr. Lisbeth Jansen from the Netherlands. So this seminar was about a theory of glass development that grows from mode coupling. So Marijke extracted the static structure factors and the intermediate scattering functions from these data by looking at the positions of the cell nuclei over time. Um, so these are the, the static structure factors and the intermediate scattering functions from experiment. And then we also applied mode coupling theory again to see if from only the static structure factor we can predict the slowdown in dynamics. And so here you see the results. These are the results from the experimental data where uh, the relaxation time grows. And the mode coupling prediction also predicts the same monotonic increase in the relaxation time. And I'm not going to go into it. I'll link it below if you want to watch it. But I would like to present to you a second archetypal person in science, which is me right now, because my work was on like mode coupling of orbits of dark matter in galaxies and mode coupling is something I understand very well. So when I watched her talk and she was like, here's mode coupling. And I was like, I understand this. I automatically thought it was right. As if me, some idiot in physics could just jump into material science and be like, aha, yes, modes, structure, I understand. And that's the second type of scientist we're going to talk about today. Who's that Pokemon? Glass is very important to science, and yet we don't understand how it works. And I think that's really, really interesting. More interesting, though, is how this field of glass blowing, glass production, has had to co evolve with science. It's just really interesting, right? Like in the olden days, you need all your beakers for your chemistry lab. What they did was they made a clay mold of like a beaker shape that you wanted. And that was put into the liquid glass and then was cooled. And then you would kind of break all the clay out and you would have a nice little glass bottle. It wasn't until the early 1900s that that process was automated. And now most glass, like if you think glass for windows, glass for cars, the glass on cell phones, it's called Gorilla Glass, is a relatively new invention. It's a chemically strengthened glass. So when you drop your cell phone, it won't break. Do you remember, I'm aging myself here, when everyone had like iPhones in high school, they all had broken screens and you would, I never had an iPhone in high school, I had a chicken nugget phone, but they would be like poking the screen and shards of glass would get on their hands and they would get a new phone and it would immediately break the glass. But that doesn't happen anymore, right? When's the last time you saw someone with a broken screen on like a newer phone? It's because you haven't, right? You haven't, it's Gorilla Glass. By the way, Gorilla Glass, invented by Corning Glassware, 
is manufactured in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, which is a tiny town outside of Danville, Kentucky, which is a tiny town like south of Lexington, Kentucky. I think that's really interesting. They make the glass and they ship it to China and they make the cell phones. That's really cool. But this poses a problem for scientists, right? Companies like Corning, who are doing this amazing work to develop new materials, new glasses, are doing this for products. They're making windows, they're making windshields, they're making cell phones. If you are a scientist in a teeny tiny lab and you need a special new fancy glass, you cannot ask Corning, a giant billion dollar huge company, Hi, Corning, I'm a scientist from South Carolina. Can you pause production in Harrodsburg and lose whatever profit you would make off of selling 300,000 cell phones and make me a very specific bulb of glass so I can do my little chemistry experiment? How much would that cost? <laughs> How much would it cost for a scientist to write a grant and say, I know that you make every windshield for Ford trucks but can you shut that down for a day so you can make my little tiny thing so I can learn about the neutron electron dipole moment, please? Like that's not gonna happen. So even though you see like glass development and engineering and manufacturing and material science developing right alongside like the fundamental physics and chemistry and biology experiments that we're doing, they're kind of breaking apart now because you cannot ask a company to pause their production line and make you a very specific thing that is gonna net them zero dollars, right? You, you just can't ask that. So what do we do? Universities on staff have glass blowers. This is what inspired this video. Glass blowers are so dope. But these rose In the past, on site at university, there would be in the chemistry department and on staff glass blower. And if you were a chemist and you needed a specific chemistry thing or you're in the physics department, you can just toodaloo on over to the glass blower and you describe the thing you need. And because they are brilliant experts in materials and physics, they make you the thing. They make you the thing. It's amazing. <laughs> Because you cannot rely on a company, you cannot purchase your very specific piece of equipment from a giant corporation. You go to the basement glass blowing lab. There is a person there with 40 years of experience and you describe the experiment you're going to do and they build you the thing. It's amazing. Let me introduce you to the third archetype in physics that I want to talk about in this video. So the first is the person who writes incomprehensible science that's probably right and they're a genius but they're not good at explaining it and they demand that you figure out what they were trying to say to you. The second are people like me who's like, I understand mode coupling. I could solve this problem <laughs> even though I can't because obviously I don't know the background. I'm not in this field. I can't solve this problem but you convinced me the mode coupling makes perfect sense to me. I get it now. Third archetype in science that I would like to introduce you to is the brilliant genius. Who's that Pokemon? Perhaps you're doing your thesis on a very specific type of fungus that grows in the Pacific Northwest. And Every time you tell a scientist about your thesis, they're like, oh, have you talked to Jennifer from Virginia State? And you're like, yeah, of course I've talked to her. She's the most brilliant person. She knows everything about this fungus. This is her livelihood. She is the smartest person you will ever talk to about this very specific fungus. And when you call Jennifer, she's so excited to talk to you. She talks your ear off for 14 hours and tells you this huge, wonderful backstory about your thesis and practically solves it for you because she knows the answers to all the questions you're going to ask. Every single glass blower is this person. <laughs> I'm not joking. They are the coolest people in science research. Every single glass blower knows fundamental physics, knows particle physics, knows 
how to make very specific glasses. So if you're like, I need my glass to keep the neutrons in, but let the electrons out, they know exactly how to do that. If you're like, I need my glass to have this shape, but it also has to be so incredibly thin that everyone says it's impossible to make the glass blower is like, I got you and they do it. They are the coolest people in physics. And I'm gonna throw out some names. I am doing this video right now because I just happened upon an article about Mike Souza. I've never had the pleasure of meeting Mike Souza, but I have heard so many stories about how awesome and brilliant and wonderful Mike Souza is. Like you go in and you're like, I need you to make this little bulb. I'm gonna look at the Faraday effect. And he's like, brilliant. And he makes it and it's perfect on first try. And he talks to you for 11 hours about the history of glass and why he made it this specific way and like the heating he used and the blowing tube he used and why it was different. And it sounds amazing and so cool. And it's not just Mike Souza, of course. Mike Souza was on the East Coast. I think he worked at Princeton, but now he's retired and like he still makes stuff though because he's the most famous. He's the importantest. Like if you're gonna use glass in your thesis, you need to talk to Mike Souza. Um, there's Rick Gerhart who worked at Caltech. He's also retired, but I think it's the same thing, but just on the West Coast version. I also think about the glass blower who worked at the University of Kentucky when I was there. I'm pretty sure he's still there, Jeff Babbitt the coolest guy you would ever meet. You would just walk by his like basement lab and he's just blasting Led Zeppelin and you could pop your head in and be like, I have a question. And he, for hours, just perfect memory recall of every single type of glass and what it does and physics experiments that require a different type of, these people are amazing. <laughs> these people are the type of people I think every scientist wants to be. To be the person where they're like, oh, you're doing this very specific, very complicated scientific thing, you need to talk to Angela, what a dream. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen for me. These people are just so cool and it's such a necessary skill, right? These big companies are not gonna make our glass. These glass blowers, these single individual people need to make this glass. Brilliant, amazing. <laughs> I realize if you haven't like worked in science, you might not get these big archetypal personalities that we see. It's just so common. I, I have an example from the Jefferson Lab Wikipedia. So Jefferson Lab is a big national lab. They have an accelerator and they have these different halls where experiments are housed and hundreds of people work at JLab and hundreds of people can work in a single experiment hall. And you can have like, I don't know, like 20 grad students and like seven postdocs and like two PIs all working on the same project. Wait, that doesn't really make sense. Like if you have 20 grad students and then seven postdocs but only two PIs. Anyway, they're all working on the same experiment, so they all need to be aware of all the goings on. So they compile these like Wikipedia like resources where you can get on and you can be like, how does the laser work on that experiment again? Like, is it compatible with what I'm doing? And all the information is stored. And when I was Googling around about Mike Souza, I found one of these pages. Let me just read it to you because they're looking at the target cell glass properties, GE 180 and Corning 720, which there's a whole thing about Corning 720 where the glass is kind of useless for like any applications besides physics where it is incredibly good at keeping helium-3 inside of it. And so Corning, the company, doesn't really manufacture it, it anymore because it doesn't make any money for them. But people like Mike Souza will use it and make it and do stuff with it because it's really good for science even though it's not doesn't have practical applications. I keep hitting my lemon tree. Okay, so on this on this Wikipedia page, it says target cell glass properties, GE 180 and Corning 720. And then they quote Mike Souza. I've worked with GE Corning 720, 724, 723, along with shots, alumino silicates. 
Mike Suze is famous for working with aluminosilicates because it's a very specific, hard to use type of glass and he's brilliant at it. And so he's like, anytime you're using that material, it's like you want to talk to Mike Souza. Okay, to keep going. Their prime use in industry is for lamps. It's a rugged seal to tongues in a much higher temperature. And he's going on and on and on. And then I clicked on the source for this quote and it's from some random talk glass forum post that Mike Souza made in 2013. World-class research institution Jefferson Lab has so much trust in Mike Sousa's opinion that they are just quoting a forum post he made and taking it as like, well, if Mike Sousa says this, it is 100% true. And I love that. I love it so much that these people exist, these brilliant minds that are just encyclopedic knowledge. I love it. For fun, I want to take you through a modern physics experiment doing like fundamental physics research to highlight the importance of this glass. So imagine you and I, we want to do some physics in our garage. We are going to set up an experiment to polarize helium-3. Why helium-3? So helium-3 is two protons, one neutron, that's the three, and two electrons. It's not charged, but because it only has one neutron, it has a spin, right? So it's essentially a tiny magnet. Polarized helium-3 means all the spins are aligned. Okay, so all the helium-3 will be pointing in the same direction. Helium-3 is like a tiny magnet. We're gonna point them all in the same direction that's gonna be polarized helium-3. For reasons I will describe later, our glass vessel has to look like this. And we ask someone very brilliant to make it for us. And they make it out of Corning 1720, which means that the helium will stay inside the glass. For reasons I will elaborate on later, we're also gonna have some rubidium and some nitrogen and some other trace stuff inside this cute little glass cell. Did you know they name these? <laughs> I found a thesis where it was from like 1998 and it was like Picard, Riker, nerds. <laughs> anyway, theirs looks like this. Ours is going to look like this. So, so we have our cell made by our brilliant glass maker and it's filled by a brilliant chemist. And there's always like a third leg on these where it's like a hole left for filling and they fill it to a pressure and they hope they don't explode the glass and then they seal it. And this is it, this is our cell. This is what we're gonna do our experiment with. This is all we're ever gonna get. How do we polarize the helium-3? That's what we're doing in our garage, you and I. Well, I've already told you that they're tiny magnets, right? So you're right. The first thing you wanna do is slap a magnetic field around this. So before you do the magnetic field, all your helium-3 is like pointing in all kind of different directions. It's like a Boltzmann distribution of gases. You slap on the magnetic field, you turn it on, and the helium-3 aligns. It's either going this way or this way, right? Just for the atomic physicists, I know that it's not 50-50, right? There's a preferred direction, and because of the energy in the room, some of those helium-3s are given enough energy to, like, kick over this way, right? So it's not 50-50, but let's assume it's 50-50. Okay, so <laughs> this is not polarized as we want it. I mean, it's if all of our helium is pointing this way or this way, it's like 50% polarized, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, but it's not as polarized as we want. So what do we do next? That's why the rubidium's in there. So this is a very, this is a very common trick, but it's very brilliant in my opinion. So you have your helium three. Now it's like this. The rubidium's just floating around, doesn't have spin, it's fine. So what we're going to do is shine a laser at the bulb of our cell at a very specific wavelength. That laser is going to excite an electron on the rubidium. And then through kinematic events that I'm glossing over, a photon will leave the rubidium and allow the electron of that rubidium to go back down. And that photon is now a very specific wavelength that will give just enough energy to this helium-3 to make it go like this. Right. And I, I can hear what you're saying. You're like, 
well, what's the point of the rubidium, right? Why not just shine a laser at that very specific photon wavelength that will make the helium-3 do this? Why not just do that? And to that I say, do you have X-ray laser money? No, <laughs> no, you don't. So we have an optical laser. We're using the rubidium as like a, a pathway to get that photon at the right energy to flip the helium-3. Brilliant. It's a good trick, right? Your, your next point is a good one, right? You're thinking, okay, but that laser that we shoot at the rubidium is going to emit photons from the rubidium that have like a positive angular momentum and a negative angular momentum, right? So for every helium-3 we're kicking this way, we're gonna kick one this way and it's gonna stay at 50%. And to that I say, good idea. We'll have a circularly polarized laser. We'll shoot it at the rubidium. It will emit a photon in only one angular momentum space. And over time, all of our helium threes are gonna do this. Brilliant, right? This is called spin exchange optical pumping. And it is a very common thing. It's a very cool thing. And I learned so much about it in order to explain it to you just now. So all of our helium three is pointing in this direction. We did it. We've done it, right? No, you're screaming at me. There is a huge problem with this idea, right? I can hear it. At room temperature, not room temperature, STP, our rubidium, it's a big boy, it's a solid. This whole laser kinematic situation doesn't work if all of our rubidium is clumped up into like a little rubidium mineral in the bottom of our target and not in the bulb where we're shooting the laser. You're right. So this whole situation has to sit inside an oven and we have to heat our cell to like 300 degrees Fahrenheit in order to make the rubidium a gas. Gas rises, right? So all of the rubidium is going to hang out in the top of this bulb where we laser and the helium-3 is going to be everywhere. This is our target. This is where we want all our helium-3 to be polarized. We've done it. Yay. But I have some devastating news. It's like all of that work, like the magnetic field, the oven, the very specific glass that has to be filled very specifically with a very specific pressure and a very specific ratio of helium to rubidium to the nitrogen, which I didn't mention, but the nitrogen is important to make the rubidium lose the photons. It's fine, it's fine. We're not into it that much. All of that to get this polarized helium-3 and that's like, like what is this, 1948? That's not a good experiment. We've done that, we do that all the time. It's not that interesting anymore. All of that work, all of that expertise from our glassmaker is like a single line on a grant application. Propose we have polarized helium-3. But these rules This setup, what we've done here is like the initial conditions of our experiment. <laughs> This is nothing. You can see why the glass is so important, right? You need it this very specific shape. It needs to have this bulb where you can hit the rubidium with a laser. It needs to have this long target bit where you can shoot the laser to do the experiment you're gonna do. And then like maybe you have optics out here, but the helium-3, the polarized helium-3 is just your initial conditions. So our glass has to withstand the lasers. It has to withstand being heated and cooled. Did you know if you heat the cell over and over and over again, the rubidium will get like absorbed? So if you're doing an experiment where you wanna take data, you constantly have to have this magnetic field running. You constantly have to have this heater on so your rubidium stays a gas. You constantly have to have this laser on, right? Because over time your helium threes will go like Bleh, and you need them to be polarized again. As soon as you turn off this laser, these are gonna start flipping until you get like your 50% again. So you need it on at all times. And then when you're done taking data for the day, whatever you're doing with your optics stuff, you turn all that off, the, ru the rubidium starts solidifying, the helium-3 tries to escape. It's a whole situation that your glass blower will make you aware of. This is what is gonna happen over time. Here's why you need a Riker cell after you finish with your Picard cell. All of this to say, Aren't glass blowers the coolest, most important people in science? Yes. <laughs>
I think this is a pretty well-known fact. Like this might not be news to anybody watching this video because if you Google scientific glass bloating, there are lots of videos and interviews and people being like interesting science careers, scientific glass blowing. Something I noticed that I just I just want to touch on is when these journalists are interviewing these very famous scientists, scientific gla glass blowers, they would often make this comment where they're like, it's almost like you're an artist. You're not a scientist. You're doing art. But these rose glasses. And I, I started noticing that Mike Souza very adamantly would say, I am not an artist. I am a scientist. We're doing science. And he would even start bringing it up before they could ask the question as if it was very common for journalists interviewing him to be like, it's almost like you're an artist. And I find this really offensive. <laughs> I just want to talk about it for a second, like glass blowing art versus science. Because obviously you can make glass art. That is a thing that exists. But these, these glass blowers are making scientific equipment. They are, they are not making art. And it's as if these journalists can't even fathom for a second that in order to be a scientist, you also have to be a creative person. So they're like, well, you're not like one of those dumb scientists who can't do anything creative or interesting. You're an artist, you're making glass art. It's offensive, right? It's, it's offensive to say like, oh, you're not a scientist, you're creative. You're a creative person because science is a very creative field. It's like, did you hear that whole thing about how, oh, the x-ray laser is very complicated, so we use the rubidium as like a conduit to get the right wavelength into our helium-3 to polarize the whole situation? That's bonkers. That's an incredibly creative and interesting idea. To come up with a science experiment, you have to be a creative person. The idea, oh, I, I just get mad thinking about it. I think about JWST. JWST was commissioned in the 90s when we were not measuring and observing a lot of exoplanets. Between the commissioning of the telescope and JWST being launched, we, we the entire field of astrophysics is overrun with people who are interested in exoplanets and you can't throw a stick without hitting someone who's like exoplanets are the most exciting and interesting things in the world which i mean i don't find them that interesting good thing i'm not in astronomy anymore i would be slaughtered on the steps anyway jwst was intended to be a galaxy like searching the earliest galaxies, looking as far back as we can and doing like cosmology things. But brilliant, creative people who for some reason are super into exoplanets, I don't get it, I don't get it. They're into it and they're like, okay, JWC is already built. All the instruments are already on board. We can't change the instruments. We can't change the instruments. How can we use those instruments to observe exoplanet atmospheres? And they come up with creative ways to use the already existing telescope to look at a thing it was not intended to look at. That's brilliant. That's creative. And now I would say like half JWST time is spent on exoplanets for some reason. It's fine. It's fine. It is so insulting for these journalists to be like, I know that you a glass blower with 50 years of experience and fundamental understanding of particle physics and chemistry and this insane ability to work with materials and understand exactly how what you put into this process is going to affect the scientific outcome of the results. But like you build things with your hands. So you're like an artist, right? It's so insulting. By the way, it's also insulting to artists. Like, they're presenting this idea like, oh, you're either creative or you're a smart person doing science. Like, what is that? That's so insulting. Like, artists have to know science. Like, an architect who designs a building has to understand structural engineering. A person who 
films the movie has to understand light and sound. Someone who writes music is just doing math. Like the idea that there's these two sides of the brain and you're either an artist or you're a scientist and oh my gosh, Mike Souza is so good at this. He can't be a scientist. It's insulting. It's offensive. Obviously, scientists have to be creative. How else would they make experiments? Obviously, artists have to be good at math and science. How else would they work with materials? How else would they produce beautiful things? There's no two sides of the coin. It's all the same. I'm so annoyed. <laughs> I was so annoyed. I'm mean, so upset about it. <sighs> For any journalist ever what? okay, the difference in art and science is the intent, right? An artist, makes a thing and they throw it out to the universe and they're like, look at this and feel feelings, right? A scientist makes a thing and they throw it out into the universe and they're like, give me answers. The difference is intent. They both require creativity and ingenuity and genius and design. It's, it, they're both important. They're both good. Stop being a, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> I'm so upset about it. Anyway, this video was inspired by Mike Souza. My research and my focus when I was in astronomy was on dark matter. And Mike Souza developed these glass shells that contain helium-3 to do a dark matter interaction experiment that I'm not gonna get into at all. But they hang outside the telescope. Like, you know, in the olden days when people would get married and they would tie like aluminum cans to the car so when they're driving it would like make noise and it'd be like just married they're hanging outside these telescopes the man had to design glass that could withstand radiation from space and like dust collision and also by the way last for 10 years 20 years without letting the helium 3 escape the glass it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's so cool. Wow. <laughs> glass is important and it's very complicated. And that's, that's the glass video. <laughs> Thanks for watching. You have any food here? All I have is a piece of hard rock candy. But it's not for eating. It's just for looking through. My videos are usually more like angry and upsetting than this. Like this whole video was just me being like, isn't this cool? It's really cool. Um, and so I was kind of excited about that. So, like just to have a nice little video where I'm not like angry or annoyed at anybody except journalists who think that scientists can't be creative or that artists can't be good at science. I don't know, but I uncovered something. I noticed that all of these scientific glass blowers have like 50 years of experience, but they're only like 65, which is interesting. And um, Netflix has this show about artistic glass blowing, like people making sculptures, and it's terrible. Netflix like sucks now. But also on that show, the people would be like, I'm 26 and I have 10 years experience in glass blowing. And I started reading interviews and I noticed Mike Souza's dad was a glass blower. And the man who retired from Caltech, he was 72 at the time and he had 55 years experience and his parents were glass blowers. And, and so I wanted to check out from the University of Kentucky and wouldn't you know. My father's a glass blower. Where is the giant Nepo baby expose in the glass blower industry? What is this? If I want to be a glass blower, I can't get into glass blowing just because I don't have 25 years experience? That's not fair. I'm calling the Wall Street Journal. It's happening. Some of my ancestors from, um, from my dad's side of the family back in the 1800s were glass blowers. So it's, I guess it's in our DNA. So it's, I guess it's in our DNA. Our DNA.